Welcome everybody to our uh, webinar on combining South Dakota trust law with an independent trustee and how it can help grow your uh, investment advisory business. My name is Anthony Jaffe. I'm the president of Sterling Trustees. Um, and along with me, I have Kevin Batterton, who uh, heads up business development for Sterling, as well as Mary Ackerman uh, from Ballot Spa in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Mary is one of the leading experts in South Dakota trust law and happy to have her with us today. Um, before we begin, I uh, want to make sure that this is an, as interactive as possible. If you have any questions, you know, click on the, the Q&A button. And uh, if you have any questions, I will pose them to the panelists uh, at the end. So uh, to keep, uh, keep this going, I'm going to just tell you what our agenda is going to be about. Uh, first, just a, a basic primer on what is a trust. And then you know, we'll get into what are the benefits of, uh, of, of South Dakota trust law. What is the role of a trustee of what Sterling can do? And then really how can combining South Dakota trust law with an independent uh, trustee such as ourselves help you build and maintain your investment practice? So uh, with any, out, any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mary, who's going to run through the first part of the agenda. Mary? Thanks, Anthony. Uh, this is Mary Ackerman. And I am, a, as Anthony said, a trust lawyer practicing in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So well, we work a lot with Sterling trustees and I am here to provide a little context from the attorney side of things. So a trust is a fiduciary arrangement that allows a third party, typically a trustee or, or uh, another fiduciary to hold assets on behalf of a beneficiary or beneficiaries. They can be arranged in many different ways and the trust terms will then specify exactly how and when the assets pass to the beneficiaries. So trusts are great structures to allow somebody else to hold funds or other property for the benefit of a third party, can provide a good um, benefits, and, and we can talk a little bit about the tax planning piece and other uh, bells and whistles that we can do in South Dakota to allow people to continue working with their trusted advisors. So go ahead, Anthony. So just the basic players in a trust relationship. And I know the, the prior slide used the term contract in parenthesis. So you can think of a trust as a contract. You can think of it as a relationship. There's some aspects of contract to it um, and some aspects of just a relationship between the parties. The grantor is the individual who establishes the trust. The grantor then will typically decide what assets go into the trust. The trustee is an individual or institution that manages the trust assets, basically holds the assets for the benefit of the beneficiary. So the beneficiary would be then the people or entities that will benefit from the trust assets. So they would have some access to the trust through the trustee. So the grantor then would use the trustee as the administrator to hold the assets. And the trustee would then follow the terms of the trust to make sure that the beneficiaries get what they are obligated to get under the document. Why would you want to use a trust? The, one of the great things about trust, particularly in the jurisdiction of South Dakota, is that they can preserve privacy. Everybody's seen TV shows where there's a big reading of the will after somebody dies and everybody sits around a big table and they're shocked by the terms of the will and, and all kinds of chaos breaks out. Well, we don't really necessarily do formal will readings. However, wills are public documents. So everybody in the world that wants to look at your will can look at it. They get filed with the probate courts. Probate courts are public records. So anybody that wants to can go and look at the probate court records. So this is why so often the media will pick up some aspects of a celebrity's will, or they'll say a celebrity died without a will, or they'll say, here's a copy of Marilyn Monroe's will or Michael Jackson's will or something like that. And they'll have a copy of the thing. It's all public. Trusts are not public, particularly in South Dakota where there is no requirement that a trust ever be filed anywhere in a public record. And even if they are filed in a court record for some reason, they would still be protected for privacy and not open to the public. Trust can also avoid probate. So with wills, wills are a tool to transfer title 
after someone dies from the person who's died to the people who are entitled to the assets after the death. Wills are subject to probate. If a person doesn't have a will or a trust, then assets continue to be subject to probate if they are titled in the name of the decedent. So probate is the transfer process by which things are retitled. If assets are held in a will, they have to be retitled upon the person's death. If they are held in a trust, the trust can continue on and hold title to them and be administered for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Or if the trust requires payment to be made upon somebody's death, they, they just get paid, the beneficiaries get paid right from the trust. There is no need to go through probate. So again, another aspect of privacy preservation also avoids probate. Saves time, saves expense, saves publicity, saves a lot of headache doing a lot of forms, much easier to administer if someone dies. A trust can also have asset protection features. It can be created with provisions to protect a person's assets from creditors, particularly in a jurisdiction like South Dakota, where South Dakota allows self-settled spendthrift trusts, which are trusts where someone sets up the trust for the benefit of him or herself or for third parties. And even though it's their own assets they put in the trust, if certain conditions are met, those assets can be creditor protected in the case of a later creditor coming and trying to get those assets. Trusts are always uh, also good instruments to protect against incapacity. So if someone has assets inside of a trust, the trustee can administer and manage those assets even if the person setting up the trust becomes incapacitated or disabled and can no longer manage their funds or manage their own personal affairs. So they're really a great way to avoid a court-ordered guardianship or a court-ordered conservatorship, both of which are a lot like pro a expensive, lots of paperwork, public, take a long time, big nuisance, so you can avoid that. Unlike wills, trusts can provide for a trustee or a investment advisor to manage property. So you can get professional property management, you have continuity in who's managing the funds. And so then if someone dies with a will, the funds will go from wherever they're custodied over to the next owner. And then the next owner will conceivably have to start from scratch with a new fund advisor, a new custodian, a new asset manager. And, and it can really um, disrupt the continuity of the asset management scheme. So trust will allow that continuity in property management. And of course, it will allow for a distribution of funds to children, especially those who are minors who could otherwise not take funds outright in their own name. Also will allow the ability to provide funds for people with special needs who might be subject to uh, divestment of government benefits if the assets weren't held in trust. One reason why South Dakota is a good jurisdiction to situs or place a trust is that we allow in South Dakota directed trusts. Directed trusts are trusts that allow the tr traditional trustee duties to be bifurcated. Traditionally a trustee, such as Sterling trustees, traditionally the trustees are gonna be your fiduciary. They're gonna handle all aspects of money management, do all the administration, all the tax returns, they're gonna handle every aspect of distribution, discretion, decision-making, who gets funds, when, they're gonna do everything. With the directed trust structure, the trustee still has authority to administer the trust and the trustee can have all of the authority that I just mentioned. But if the person setting up the trust desires, the trust can be bifurcated into different uh, advisors who can handle different things. So you would have an administrative trustee such as Sterling and you could then have Sterling um, do the traditional trustee duties or you could have an investment advisor named and that investment advisor would handle all of the fund management and all of the investment decisions. You could also have a distribution advisor named. The distribution advisor would then tell Sterling who to send money to and when and how much. You could also have a trust protector. Trust protector is a third party watchdog that can watch over all of the other advisors, make sure they're doing what they're doing. And if allowed, a trust protector could have a lot of powers to um, 
help if there's issues with the trust, interpret the terms of the trust, fix things about the trust that don't work in the future, if tax laws change or the finan uh, financials change or the family dynamic changes, lots of great flexibility. As I mentioned earlier, South Dakota allows self-settled spendthrift trusts, also known as asset protection trusts. It also allows dynasty trusts, which are trusts that go from generation generation to generation without making a final distribution. The benefit of, of that is that it never triggers federal or state estate or transfer taxes. South Dakota also does not have any estate taxes. In addition, South Dakota does not have a state income tax on trust corporations or individuals. So any income that's accumulated in the trust at the trust level would not be subject to state tax if it's situs in South Dakota. As I mentioned earlier, South Dakota has the best privacy laws in the country. So it's a great jurisdiction for high profile families, families that are concerned about privacy or security, families who just would prefer that nobody knows what they're doing with their wealth, families who have concern about being targeted for lawsuits or extortion or that sort of things. It sounds a little far-fetched sometimes, but it's a very real concern among ultra high net worth families. It is not uncommon for families that have significant assets to be targeted by unscrupulous businesses or people who are trying to sell them things or take advantage of them. And this just kind of gives them a little bit of a shield from that, which is really, really helpful and very useful. The privacy laws also come in very, very, very handy. If there is an intra-family dispute of any kind, then it's all shielded from the media. So if, if a family were to set up a trust and there would be, say, a high profile divorce or something of that nature or a dispute about the family business, then any of that that's litigated here in South Dakota would all be protected from public record and would not be out in the media causing problems upon problems for these families. South Dakota also has very flexible standards as far as decanting trust. Decanting trust would be where assets from one trust are poured into or moved over to another trust that perhaps has different or more favorable terms. So if a family is dealing with a trust that worked fine when it was set up a few decades ago, but no longer works well for the family's needs, assets can be poured from that trust into a new trust with better terms. An alternative to decanting would be modification. South Dakota has very flexible modification statutes where parties can, upon agreement or through uh, court order, have trusts modified to modernize them, to update them, to resolve tax issues, to change things to accommodate different family dynamic changes, all of those sorts of things. And a reformation would be very similar to a modification, except it's done through the court system, where a court order takes the trust and, set, and the judge says for some reason, Perhaps there was an error, perhaps things have changed, perhaps there's some reason why this trust, trust needs an order modifying or reforming the terms, in which case we can go in and get those. It's a pretty simple process, doesn't take too long, not costly, typically not adversarial, also not subject to public record as I had mentioned earlier. There's a number of reasons how South Dakota developed into a, what I would call a trust haven. So this would be a situs where we have a lot of high net worth families coming in and taking advantage of it, which is all perfectly allowed. It's above board. It's completely appropriate. And this started back in about 1981. There was a Wisconsin family trying to avoid state income tax on the sale of a family owned business. They at that time moved the trust to South Dakota. South Dakota did not have and still does not have a state capital gains tax. So the family saved about $12 million in state income tax by moving to South Dakota. I should mention in this that there are some jurisdictions that have noticed this was happening and have enacted resident trust statutes in an attempt to avoid this type of thing, but in, in many situations it can still be avoided. So it's something where 
it's definitely worth looking at in these types of situations, even though certain states have attempted to curtail it a little bit. Because we've got uh, each state in the US has its own laws and one state can't really control what another one is doing. And we've seen a number of cases where the or originating state has attempted to hang on to the taxing authority and has been unsuccessful when there's been litigation. So just uh, keep in mind that this is an evolving area, but it's still a really effective thing to avoid state income tax and, and worth looking at. In 1983, South Dakota abolished the rule against perpetuities. The rule against perpetuities was um, kind of an archaic holdover from England where it said that nobody could own property forever with no restrictions on it. It was intended to uh, put limits on how things could be owned. South Dakota abolished that rule. It is no longer in effect, hasn't been for decades. Combining that with no state income tax then kind of thrust South Dakota into the limelight when it comes to trust jurisdiction. And a number of banks and trust companies have established state charters or federal charters here in South Dakota. So it is definitely a spot where we have um, lots and lots of this industry occurring and have been for decades. In 1996, South Dakota adopted some directed trust statutes, which made our statutes much more flexible and modern. So I would say that that is what I would call modern trust planning, uh, including all of those bells and whistles. Since then, other jurisdictions have adopted similar statutes, but they're still not uniform across all 50 states. And those states that do have them often don't have statutes as flexible as what we have in South Dakota. In 2001, the Governor's Trust Task Force was established. It's a think tank of lawyers and bank personnel who get together every year to examine the trust laws and determine whether there would be any need for updating trust laws, they put together proposed litigation, or I'm sorry, legislation, send it to the legislature, and the legislature then uh, reviews and decides whether to pass it. The trust task force has been given a lot of credence with the legislature, and is generally considered to be um, an authoritative source on what should happen with the trust law. So that what that does is give South Dakota an immense amount of flexibility and how to respond to things that are happening in the world. Tax laws, changes in society, changes in other jurisdictions laws, privacy issues. If people are using the jurisdiction, families are using the jurisdiction, people like me are working in the jurisdiction, people like Sterling are administering trust in the jurisdiction, our feedback is welcome as to what we can do to improve the trust laws. So every year the trust laws are tweaked to make improvements, to fix any little glitch that's noticed, to just make them better, stronger, and more favorable overall for the industry. In South Dakota, we have 120 approximately public and private state chartered trust companies with over 250 billion in assets. This is a, a very, very significant industry with very, very sophisticated group of banks and trust companies administering trust. And that number doesn't even include the OCC or FDIC regulated entities. So South Dakota overall custody is 2.9 trillion of bank assets. It's the largest in the country and almost twice as large as any other state in the country. So people sometimes are, are surprised to hear that, that South Dakota has more bank assets than any other company, but, but we do. And it's in part because of the trust industry and also in, in part because of a very large banking industry here in the state and we have several large national banks that are chartered in the state. Steve Oceans, who's a lawyer in Las Vegas, does a national ranking every year along with a publication called Trust in a State magazine and South Dakota always ranks very, very well in asset protection, decanting, dynasty trust and state income taxation. So South Dakota is usually going to come up number one or two on those rankings, depending on who's doing the ranking in the year and what what little discrete area is being ranked. And it's important to note, as I did, that Steve Oceans actually practices estate planning in Nevada and will on many of his rankings give South Dakota a higher ranking 
than Nevada. So I think that says a lot. There's different types of trust administration that are available inside the jurisdiction and different types of options that families can take advantage of. So as I had mentioned earlier, a full trusteeship would be the one-stop shopping. So a bank or a full service trust company does everything. They custody the assets, they do all the tax returns, they do all the accountings, do all the administration, do all the money management, handle all the distributions. That is still available. That would be the old school way of doing business, I would call it, the, the main street bank that takes the assets and just does everything. Nothing wrong with it. It's still completely viable. However, many clients prefer a little more flexibility. I still have clients that call or meet with me and they say, well, we're not, we don't want to trust because we know how that works, because when my grandpa or uncle set one up, all the stuff went over to the bank, then they liquidated everything and they invested it in their own funds because they wanted to make a big commission. And then they would never distribute anything because the more stuff they held on to, the bigger the commission they got. They didn't take our phone calls and they acted like they were our parent and wouldn't give us any money. I hear it at least weekly. And I am not suggesting that every bank or trust company that's a full trust company or full trustee does, does those things, but that is a definite perception that clients have. And it's just simply not the case in South Dakota, is particularly when you go to a delegated or directed trustee structure, or if a family starts its own private trust company. So a delegated structure would be a trustee has investment authority but also has the right to and decides to delegate that authority to an outside investment advisor. And then the trustee retains the distribution power. In these situations, the trustee still has the power. They just delegate it to another party, a professional investment advisor. And then the trustee monitors the investment advisor, makes sure everything is going well, checks in, makes sure that things are appropriate, but ultimately the investment advisor manages the funds. The directed trust structure is a similar set, set up, but the authority flows in a different direction. So with the delegated trustee, the trustee has the authority and they delegate. So the authority flows from the trustee over to the investment advisor. With the directed trustee, the document is structured so that the investment committee has the authority to make investment decisions, but then they direct the trustee on implementing that. So the, the authority is kind of vested in the investment committee and it flows over to the trustee. So uh, it's a trifurcation of the traditional trustee role where you can uh, trifurcate into administrative trustee investment committee and reformation, or I'm sorry, and uh, trust protector distribution committee. So you've got the administrative trustee doing their thing, keeping the books and records, getting your CITES, Investment committee running investments, distribution committees making distribution decisions, and the trust protector would be that third party watchdog that we talked about. So if you are used to dealing with California, if you dealt with California, they have kind of a tradition of bifurcating this in a similar way, but they, rather than having advisors or committees who act in a fiduciary role, they just have different trustees. So they'll have an administrative trustee, investment trustee, distribution trustee. This is a slightly different setup that we have in South Dakota. The trustee is still the trustee and the only trustee. The investment committee or advisor is still a fiduciary, but they are not truly a trustee. Same with the distribution committee. And the trust protector is just a third party watchdog who may or may not be a fiduciary, depending on what roles they're given and what the document says. So as uh, we mentioned earlier, South Dakota has very flexible laws on reformations, modifications, or decantings. And the way that we use these often is families will approach us and say, you know what, this trust isn't working anymore. We don't have the authority that we want. We don't have enough control. We're, we're concerned. Is there anything we can do? So what, what we do is get a lot of business that will come in and families will then ask for the trust to come into the jurisdiction 
So they'll appoint a trustee like Sterling Trustees. And then we can reform the trust to make it a directed trust, or we can modify it by agreement of the parties, reform through the court, or decant from the old trust into a new trust. So you can go from that full trustee to a delegated, or from a full trustee to a directed, or from a delegated trustee to a directed. Most full trustees are still going to have the power to delegate, even if the document doesn't say it. It's kind of a basic concept in trust administration. But either way, if you want to get to that directed trust structure, it's not difficult to do. So families that may be interested in using directed trust structure can bring the trust into the jurisdiction and then reform, modify, or decant to get to that directed trust structure. The benefit of this, of course, is to give the family more control and flexibility, particularly with regard to investments and distributions, much more family involvement. Families like this. It can give them involvement and control without creating any adverse estate taxes, which is what they were trying to avoid in the first place by setting up the estate planning vehicle in a full trustee type model. South Dakota is also a very popular jurisdiction for private family trust companies. These are typically set up as an LLC. It's owned by the family themselves. Sometimes it's owned by purpose trust. And they themselves are trust companies in South Dakota. So they're qualified as trust companies. They get a charter to be a qualified trust company in South Dakota and can serve as trustee of the various family trusts. In South Dakota, these entities are regulated. In some other jurisdictions, they allow unregulated trust companies. The benefit of the regulated entity is that they are exempt from SEC regulation under the family office umbrella, whereas unregulated do not necessarily share that benefit. Also, the regulated entities are less likely to create control issues that could trigger some federal estate taxes with respect to having a family-owned entity administering trust for the benefit of that same family. Again, with the tr uh, directed trust model, this slide I think does a good job of kind of breaking down how the authority flows. Because you'll see the arrows from the investment committee and the distribution committee are flowing to the trustee. So as, instead of a traditional flow chart where everything flows in one direction, you'll see the trustee is the center. The trustee is the center, the centerpiece, the administrator, they own the assets, manage the bank accounts, do the tax returns or arrange for preparation, do all the accountings and statements, but they take direction from the investment committee and the distribution committee. The investment committee directs them on how the assets are to be invested. So a lot of times the family will have a, a family business that they want to continue to invest in. So they will have someone be the investment committee or authority it can be a special purpose entity, it can be a natural person, it can be a committee of people. The investment committee will decide, we want to continue to invest in this family business. So they will advise the trustee or direct the trustee to continue to own that. This pre creates a lot of control and flexibility for the family. It also alleviates the trustee from having concern about, oh, may perhaps continuing to hold an operating business or a closely held business or a concentration of asset in one type of asset, which is something that the traditional trust model um, wasn't geared toward. So these vehicles were great for non-traditional assets, for entrepreneurial type clients, clients with large concentrations in stock. Perhaps it was the family business and it went public and now they hold a lot of stock in the same company, even if it's publicly held, it works great for that. And then they don't have to worry about, oh, I'm going to set this trust up and the trustee is going to liquidate up my family business. And if I've got, you know, oh, millions of dollars of public stock that I have a really low basis in, it's going to create this capital gains issue for me. They don't have to worry. But the distribution committee, the distribution committee or our advisor, again, can be a natural person, a group of natural people or a special purpose entity. That committee has the authority to direct the trustee to make distributions. So it can help to guide the trustee as to how and when to make distributions, alleviate some potential liability that the trustee may already be worried about if they're making the distribution decisions, and it can allow 
um, some of the fam family dynamic to be respected by someone that actually knows the family really well. The trust protector over on the left side is going to have a powers that are available either through statute or through the document. So in South Dakota, we have a really long list of potential powers that a trust protector could have. So I like to have families look at that and then tell me which powers are they comfortable with. So some of the most common powers that are used would be ability to remove and replace trustees, appoint new trustees, appoint additional trustees, change situs, um, approve or consent to or veto distributions um, to modify or reform the trust or add or remove beneficiaries. Those last two powers are very, very powerful and, and giving a trust protector this, if the family is comfortable with it, can alleviate problems down the road if things change and it can really reduce the amount of cost to the family if things change and they need to make changes. Just to give a little bit of a comparison on how these directed trust structures work in um, different situations. Um, we're dealing with individual New York or California trustees, corporate trustees or directed trust structures. So you'll just take a look at whether family and friends can control the investments. And of course, not usually in a corporate trust situation, but definitely in a, in a directed trust situation whether a family or friend or business associate or trusted third party can control distributions. Um, yeah, potentially with an individual trustee, but with California, you've got some tax issues that you should be aware of. So I'm, I'm not a California licensed lawyer, but just be aware of that. Um, corporate trustees are generally not going to allow that type of thing unless it's a directed trust structure or you have a separate trustee. So with a directed trust structure, yes, you absolutely can, but you do need for estate tax purposes to have some structure in place so that you don't create a state tax inclusion for somebody who would be a family member or a related or important party under tax law. Liability, yes, as a personal trustee and individual trustee, there's very high liability. And there's also an unlikely to be liability coverage available. I've tried over the years to get liability coverage for individual trustees. It is hard to secure and it is expensive. So there's a lot of risk to the family in using an individual. With the corporate, um, there is personal liability potentially with a personal co-trustee. A corporate trustee is gonna have usually some protection from personal liability. With a directed trust structure, there's limited liability only as to certain aspects. So your trustee is going to be doing more administrative things. As long as in South Dakota, the trustee isn't grossly negligent or will has conducts willful misconduct, then they'll probably have less liability. Trust protectors are generally not available in every structure. They, they are available in the directed trust structure and in some jurisdictions, but not in every jurisdiction. Again, with the state income tax, if you're situs in a state that does tax trust, you're going to be subject to that state income tax, not in South Dakota. One of the very largest benefits to using a state like South Dakota. Asset diversi diversification requirements is typically gonna be under the prudent invest investment standard. It's gonna be by statute, probably even by the trust instrument in most jurisdictions. In South Dakota, I personally put in my documents that the prudent investor standard is waived because it allows families that flexibility to invest in more non-traditional types of assets. And our statutes also are, are much more flexible about that standard. Um, as far as broad-based investment strategy and, and flexibility, same situation. So in South Dakota with a directed trust structure, there's much more flexibility as to how assets can be invested and what the family can do. They can hold, this trust can hold operating businesses and private equity and all kinds of non-traditional assets without having to go through all of the scrutiny and all of the no's and all of the gatekeepers that you might encounter with the corporate trustee. And also um, the trustee's initial due diligence and quarterly monitoring is much higher level with the other types of jurisdictions with a directed trust structure. The trustee is relying on those other parties to take care of some of these things. So it's less of a burden for the trustee 
and we have other actors that are taking care of some of those things. So it's just a lot more streamlined. And for your trustee, it's, it's a lot less responsibility for the trustee, but, uh, but it still gives you access to the jurisdiction to do everything you need to do. Um, again, as we mentioned earlier, South Dakota was the first state in the country to allow, truly allow a dynasty trust. Um, once the rule against perpetuities was abolished, this really was the start of modern trust law planning. Uh, there's never a forced distribution of assets on these things. It's a great planning tool. What it does is allows that family wealth to be protected, held in a, in a vehicle to protect against creditors, to protect against taxes, to protect against the family itself, maybe spendthrifts or imprudent investments, and it keeps that continuity going through generations. Not every state has abolished the rule against perpetuities. In fact, many have not, and some that have haven't truly abolished it. They've just modified it. Keep in mind that there are constitutional issues, and there are some states that hold themselves out as dynasty trust states, but they truly are not. And there's issues that perhaps make them less desirable if you're looking for a true perpetual jurisdiction. As far as a uh, protector goes, protectors are a great third party watchdog. They can watch over the trust and they can have substantive powers to go in and fix things that are broken, to modernize, to prevent problems, to be uh, a second opinion, so to speak, if, if needed. So they pr provide a lot of flexibility. In South Dakota, a trust protector isn't a fiduciary unless you say they are in the document. So it's a consideration to think about. They can be given the power to veto or direct distributions, remove and replace fiduciaries, remove and replace fiduciaries, change situs or governing law veto investment decisions or direct them. Uh, so those are the same powers that you might see with an investment advisor and you can do that. The trust protector can have those powers. They can consent to an exercise of a power of appointment, amend the trust, approve accountings, terminate the trust, take notice on behalf of somebody, lots and lots of flexibility. One reason why uh, somebody setting up a trust would want a protector would be if they think the trustee isn't gonna follow their wishes, or perhaps they think the trustee doesn't really know them as well as the protector. They don't, the trustee is a company, maybe with different staff, whereas they name a protector that really knows them and their businesses and their family ethos. Maybe they want to strip some powers away from the trustee and give it to somebody else. So that's why I sometimes use that term third party watchdog. Or maybe they just want them as a point of contact to kind of a liaison between the different parties to keep the thing moving in the right direction and watch out for everybody. The difference between a reformation and modification, we talked about a little bit. It's reformation and modification is when you typically will keep the old trust but modernize the terms, either through a family agreement or through a court order. Decanting is where you move the trust assets from an old trust to a new trust. So if, the statutes allow, which they do in South Dakota, a trustee can use their power to distribute assets to move those assets into a new trust. So this is going to apply if you're in a state with a decanting statute or if you've got a state that allows common law decanting, which there's, I think, only three that do that. So South Dakota has great, flexible decanting statutes. There are other states that also allow it, Delaware, Florida, Alaska. Nevada, New Hampshire, South Dakota, and Wyoming. Iowa has common law decanting, but I've never really used it. I'm an Iowa lawyer and I've been asked to use it. And we've kind of always concluded we should move the trust to South Dakota and do it here, which is what we've done. Decanting in South Dakota is considered exercise of a power of appointment. So the trustee has the power to appoint those assets somewhere else. And it works really well. Great tool, lots of flexibility. Example of a decant that might be desirable for a family would be if they've got a New York law trust, New York governs interpretation, validity, construction, administration. If the trustee has power to distribute assets, they, and there's a way to get a South Dakota 
qualified trustee, such as a South Dakota trust company like Sterling, honest trustee. Once you do that, even if you're governed by New York substantive law, once you are administering in South Dakota, you can use South Dakota's decanting statutes to move into a new trust that's a South Dakota law trust with a South Dakota trustee. You can even change the governing law to South Dakota law if you'd want. One caveat is that be careful if you're dealing with generation skipping transfer taxes. Those require a little bit of special tinkering, but you can still do it with some modifications. Reasons that clients might want to decant, they want to modify powers of appointment, amend administrative provisions, add a spendthrift provision, add or remove a grantor trust provision, combine trust, separate trust, Example I had once was that the patriarch had died and he had set up one trust for the benefit of his two children. And it was a pot trust and the children couldn't decide how to invest. One child wanted very conservative, marketable securities, very safe. The other child wanted a very speculative uh, investments, all sorts of new technologies and private equity and closely held businesses and wanted to buy a baseball team and all kinds of stuff like that. We just separated them out. She got her trust, he got his. It's a way to segregate higher risk assets put in a different trust. As we mentioned earlier, you can avoid state and local taxes sometimes. You can protect from Medicaid eligibility if you've got a trust that wouldn't otherwise do that and you've got a beneficiary who might have those government benefit concerns. You can amend the trustee succession provisions, which is a big aspect that I run into all the time. If you don't have flexible trustee succession provisions, then that can be a roadblock for a lot of this modern trust planning. You can, in some situations, extend the term of a trust. Be careful with that if you're dealing with generation skipping transfer tax trust or grandfathered, or if you've allocated GST exemption to the trust. You can change the governing law. Again, be careful with GSD grandfather trusts. Or very simply, correct an error or an ambiguity. Happens all the time. There's an error, no one knows how to fix it. Decanting will typically work great. As we, as we mentioned earlier, privacy is very important to high net worth and ultra high net worth clients. It's, they're very concerned about lawsuits. They're concerned about protection from creditor, divorcing spouses, in-laws and outlaws. <laughs> That's our big joke is we don't want the in-laws to become outlaws, which they often do when people start fighting. So South Dakota has quiet trusts. We can draft trusts where nobody gets notice of the trust at all. They don't get accountings. They don't know it exists. Never. It's an option. It's not for everybody, but it is an option. If the trusts do go to the court for some reason, they can be sealed or they are automatically sealed for privacy. Other court seals are not as effective as South Dakota's. Alaska's is discretionary. Delaware's is discretionary, only limited to three years. Nevada's, Wyoming's, and New Hampshire's are all discretionary. Ours is mandatory. You don't even have to ask for it. It just happens. The old trust model, as we mentioned earlier, would be the bank takes control of everything. And this is what, it isn't, not all banks are inflexible, but this is what clients sometimes are worried about because this can be a much less flexible model. Better model, more modern, more flexible. You've got your trustee, you've got your investment advisor, and you've got a custodian. You can separate those duties get rid of the distribution bias where you have a corporate fiduciary holding the assets, not wanting to distribute because then it reduces their commission. It's a collaborative effort and you get really good expertise in each area that you're working with. And one question I get asked a lot is, do I have to have all my assets custodied in South Dakota if I have a South Dakota trust? And the answer is no. The statute says some or all assets should be custodied in South Dakota. Some means not everything and most clients do not have everything so that is a common question and um i am going to turn this over to kevin at some point so um thank one, you Marie. i, I yep. appreciate it uh, great job by the way um 
let's talk about why the independent model is better. Um, and it's better for the advisor because of this unbundling effect. So, um, you know, Mary had talked about the old model, uh, bank trust company uh, probably did everything where the trustee also managed the money, uh, also made the distributions and you can unbundle those services in a state like South Dakota. It's a win-win for both the client and the advisor. The advisor gets to manage the money, um, the client gets to work with who they want to work with and has, you know, more control. Um, you know, many, and, and Mary had talked about this, you know, many of the large bank owned trust companies, uh, you know, clients are growing weary about their inflexibility and trust officer turnover. Um, you know, it, it's true. I mean, it happens. Um, you know, I remember talking to a family a number of years ago um, who had uh, three trust officers assigned to their uh, trust in the last four years. Uh, nobody really made an effort to, you know, reach out to them. In fact, the last uh, trust officer they were aware of uh, left the institution in his uh, voicemail uh, was not terminated. So they kept leaving messages wondering, you know, why nobody was getting back to them. So it, it does happen. Um, it, it doesn't happen with an independent trust company. Um, because of our model and because our trust officers are attentive to administering their trusts and, and their clients, uh, the advisor you know, gets to be the financial quarterback for the family. And, you know, in all instances, I mean, the advisor is the focal point for the client relationship. How can an independent trustee help RIAs? Um, you know, if you're faced with a situation, I would say, you know, call us. Um, you have, uh, our contact information. Uh, we'll talk about the situation that you're faced with and, and how to move uh, those uh, monies or the trust account from a, tr a traditional you know, trust company that's bundling everything together and how to get you to a point. You know, we're working with Sterling uh, trustees uh, can help you move uh, those client assets and onboard that, that trust account. Uh, we, we're more than happy to provide education to families uh, as well as education to the advisor. And some advisors are larger than others. Uh, you may you know, work for a company that you know, provides that level of support, which is great. Um, you may be a small uh, you know, solo practitioner that is looking for you know, outside help with that, and we're happy to, uh, to help you. Uh, any way that we can. Uh, we also provide integrated technology in terms of reporting. So um, you may have multiple custodians. Uh, we can combine that and report the trust assets uh, to, to the client. Can trusts help investment advisors? Well, you know, my experience tells me that trust assets are, are sticky assets. So they're they're very important to the long-term, you know, health and growth of financial advisors. Um, trust assets, in fact, are, um, you know, let's say three times uh, as likely to stay with uh, an advisor under advisement of the assets, you know, as a personal account is. So, you know, a personal account, uh, you know, the advisor, you know, retires, the client goes someplace else, um, you know, their nephew Joey landed a job, uh, you know, managing money somewhere, and they decided to throw them a bone, and the trust assets leave. There's a, there's a lot of reasons why uh, trust assets uh, will stick around versus a personal account. Um, statistics show that uh, if, if assets are not held in a trust, uh, they're only retained by the advisor 
you know, maybe 20% uh, of the time. And, and frankly, uh, if there is a trust and the advisor is not aware of, you know, who the successor trustee is or, you know, maybe does not have the same relationship with the next generation, uh, the heirs uh, or the beneficiaries of the trust, uh, those assets are at risk as well. Um, so, you know, in the directed trust model, if an advisor is named in that document uh, with an independent uh, trust company, such as Sterling Trustees, uh, then that may eliminate the risk of a bank trustee, for example, uh, poaching the assets or, you know, the assets just simply moving by virtue of the fact that a beneficiary has a relationship with another advisor uh, that they want to use. Uh, what makes Sterling trustees an ideal partner? Uh, well, you know, we are an independent trust company. Uh, we do not manage any assets. Uh, we are not uh, competing with the advisor or any of the client's uh, financial professionals, uh, for that matter. Um, we are, are simply administering uh, the trust. And, and we've got a lot of experience uh, with individual advisors. Uh, we work with them all the time. Uh, we're moving trusts from other organizations all the time. So again, you know, call us and we'll tell you how, how that works. Um, we are custodian agnostic. So no matter what platform uh, you might be on, uh, you can retain uh, that platform. Um, you can keep the assets uh, where they are currently. You can trade the way you currently trade. Uh, it's seamless to both the advisor and their clients. Uh, we are a chartered South Dakota trust company. Uh, Mary's talked about all the benefits and advantages of South Dakota as a trust jurisdiction. Um, and we mitigate ne negative family dynamics. Um, you know, I, I might be biased in my view, but I've seen over the years that it's never a good idea to, to name an individual as a trustee, uh, liability being uh, first and foremost, Mary talked about that a little bit, um, uh, but also, you know, there's some bias, you know, who, who knows the beneficiaries, who favors one over the other. Um, you know, those are situations you want to avoid by naming an independent trustee. And again, you know, we'll never uh, poach your clients. Uh, they are your clients. Uh, the idea is to help you. Uh, retain assets or onboard new assets uh, and to grow your investments under management. Um, we, we don't compete with you in any way, shape or form. So again, uh, please call us and let us help you uh, any way that we can. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin and Mary. I really appreciate your, your insight today. Um, we will post this webinar uh, on our website. So uh, if you want to uh, review again, it'll be there. And uh, we'll also have our contact information and uh, for both Mary and for Kevin, uh, in case you've got any follow up uh, further questions. So again, thanks everybody for their time today and uh, appreciate you tuning in. Thanks.